We've taken a little break from investigating Input Shaper and its benefits, but today we're back. We're going to get it configured inside Marlin firmware. Hello everyone, Chris here, and Input Shaping is no doubt an impressive feature that you probably want to try on your 3D printer. And I know we've talked about it a bit in the past, but Input Shaping is basically resonance compensation. It's a way to solve a problem that every moving machine has inside the software. Your 3D printer is moving around quickly, stopping and starting, and when doing that, it's causing vibrations. Those vibrations can be seen on your 3D printed part. We like to call those artifacts ghosting or ringing, and Input Shaper does a really good job at mitigating those issues. So now it's available inside Marlin firmware, and that's important for a reason. Marlin is still the most popular type of firmware that we run on 3D printers today. So think about if you're running Marlin on a machine already, like I am, you can flash to the newest version, uncomment a few lines, and then you have Input Shaper ready to go and you get all of those benefits. But then think about all of the 3D printer companies that are using Marlin on their 3D printers. All they have to do is update their config and they've automatically made their 3D printer even better. It increases the print quality almost instantly. So we definitely want to check this out. And that's what we're going to do today. So let's jump into this whole thing. We're going to get it calibrated, but let's start by taking a look at the implementation of Input Shaper on the Marlin website. So here we go. As always, I like to start with the manual page when we do things here in Marlin. They always have pretty good documentation and input shaping is spelled out pretty clearly. There are a couple things you need to know. Because of the way Marlin is utilized on the board with just the MCU, it's all in one package. You don't have GPIO pins like you would in Clipper off your Raspberry Pi, so running an accelerometer is going to be pretty difficult. Marlin does not support that at the moment. But we do have the STL file for the ringing tower. This is the same part that we use to tune in Input Shaper on Clipper. So we're going to download that, and I'll show you how to set it up. And then we're also going to use some scripting with the M593 command. That's the command you use to set up Input Shaper. But we have a script that will run every layer change so that we can ramp up the frequency for input shaping so we can figure out which frequency we need for our 3D printer. Then you can do some math to figure this all out. But I'll show you a really easy workaround to get this done so you don't have to write any of this down at all. But we'll get into that later. First, we need to set up our test print. So here's the test part that you've probably seen before. Leave it in this orientation. You're going to want Y on the front side, X along the Y. That's just how it works. If you have a core XY, you're going to want to turn it 45 degrees. But there's a lot of settings in the slicer that might hurt the input shaping calibration. So we want to turn all those off and we want to slice this part a certain way. So let's just start in print settings. We're going to set this to vase mode. You could probably do this with just a couple of parameters but Marlin suggests vase mode, so we're going to go that route just to make sure we're following the directions. Let it go ahead and make all the changes to set it correctly. You have one perimeter and a couple of bottoms. Make sure you're set at a 0.2 layer height. That's how the calibration works. The vase mode should have already set it to 0% infill. And then the next thing we need to be concerned with is speed. Now we want to print this part at a pretty good clip. So I'm going to do perimeters at 100, externals at 100, just because I don't remember exactly which one vase mode impacts, we could look on the other screen, but it's not going to hurt anything to change both. So we're setting it 100 millimeters a second. You also have to consider anything that has acceleration control. We need to turn that off. So down here in advanced, we're just going to set all of these to zero. We don't want it to throttle any of these settings. We want to see exactly what the settings are as we ramp up through the part so we know how to tune it. Auto speed's the same way. I'm just going to go ahead and set it up to 200. 150 should have been fine, but we don't want this to impact our test part at all. The next thing we need to do is head to filament settings. Now, if you're using PLA, which I recommend you do, go into your cooling settings. You don't want auto cooling running during this test. We're going to take it off. Auto cooling will slow down a layer if it doesn't take long enough so that the part fan has time to cool off the filament. We don't want that to happen in this test. We don't need it anyway. And then in custom G-code, make sure linear advance isn't being turned on. My firmware configuration has it enabled, but by default it's set to zero. 
So if you just delete all of these linear advanced settings, if you're using Prusa Slicer, make sure there's nothing in here. We want it to stay off for the test. And then we can head to printer settings. Now, depending on the firmware setting you have, if you have it set to legacy Marlin, you're going to have machine limits enabled. Make sure that these are turned off. We'll just turn it to ignore. This will allow whatever settings you have in the firmware to be the setting that it's going to be during the test. I believe I have mine set to 3000 Excel. That should be more than good enough for the test we're going to do. And then here is where the custom G code comes in. So if we head back to the Marlin site, this is the command that's been provided to use in Prusa Slicer. We'll just copy this whole line, head back to Prusa Slicer, and we're going to run that command after every layer change. We'll just paste it in here. All this is going to do is take the layer number and then increase the frequency bit by bit after every layer so that we can see it ratchet up so we can get a good idea what frequency we need to set for our printer. One setting that we're going to have to add here is G92E0. Prusa Slicer uses this to calculate certain things with the extruder. You have to reset it after every layer. It's not going to hurt anything for the test, but Prusa Slicer will complain about it if you don't add it in here. So with all that, we can head back and we can slice it. And here's our test part. If you'd like to switch to the feature just to show what the speed is, there's 100 millimeters a second, and this should be a valid test. Now, you just saw me add that custom G code with that Marlin command for input shaping. We haven't turned input shaping on yet. That's the biggest part to this whole video is you have to flash to the newest version of Marlin to be able to use input shaping. And that can be difficult for some folks. In the version 2.1.2 of Marlin, if you go to configuration underscore ADV.h, there's the input shaping settings. Now, by default, these are commented out. I haven't flashed the firmware to my printer yet, so it's still disabled. I'm going to run my test as a baseline and then come back and we'll enable input shaping so that we can compare them. If you need to update to the newest version of Marlin, hopefully you have your existing configuration. You can use something like Notepad++ with the compare plugin. That way you can take your old configuration.h and compare it to the new version 2.1.2 and you can make those changes as it calls them out. You can also do that same kind of thing here in VS Code. Have both of your configuration files open, and then the left pane in the File Explorer, you can just right click, select for compare, and then your other configuration.h file, compare with selected. And it's gonna do the same thing as Notepad++. You can run through all of these and make the changes to update to the newest version of Marlin. I do have videos where I run through this process. I will leave one in the description in case you're struggling with this. But for now, Input Shaper is off. So let's go ahead and take a baseline print and take a look at it. And I know with Marlin firmware, this is the biggest downside. Trying to upgrade from one version to the next can be somewhat difficult. I hear that all the time. And it is a bit easier in different types of firmware. But if you've been holding off upgrading Marlin, now is the time to do it. Input Shaper being implemented is probably one of the biggest performance and print quality bumps that you can have. So give it a try. Hopefully it's not too difficult. I have some videos out there. I will leave links, but let's go ahead and continue on. We'll take a look at our baseline print. And here's the baseline print. Again, remember Input Shaper is off. We haven't flashed the firmware yet, but this is what we're looking for right in here. If you've seen my other Input Shaper videos, this is ringing or ghosting. It's resonance from the printer. So vibration that's caused by the moving mass of the bed or the print head. This is what we want to reduce. So this is X and this is Y. You can best see it right in here. So this is the before picture. Don't worry, we'll compare them after we run our tests. So the baseline print is done. Now we need to enable input shaper so we're just going to take the comments off of these lines here in configuration underscore ADV.h for X and Y. Now these values down here, we don't know what they are. Since we're running this calibration G code, it actually uses the command to change these on the fly. After you know what frequency that makes your part look the best, you can come in here and update it and then it'll be that way permanently. Now, 
it isn't something that's going to stay the same all the time. But if you don't make any large changes to your printer, like adding mass to your bed or your print head, or reducing it, you shouldn't have to change this value very often. But for now, we're just going to enable it, we're going to flash the firmware, and if we use EEPROM, like I'm going to show you here later, we don't have to mess with this again. Or you could set it permanent if you wish. So let's compile, and we'll get it loaded to the printer. So here's the result of the calibration print. Now, we just have input shaping enabled. Remember, it's making changes all through the print. But you can see, as we come up the line, it starts increasing the frequency. It almost starts to disappear right in here. If you take a look at different aspects of the part, it's going to be a little bit more obvious here and there. But pay attention to this gap as well. This is going to give you an idea of input shaping if it's actually too much. You don't want to see gaps in the part. It has to be relatively close. So we don't want to overdo it either. But this is X, and here's Y. So again, roughly the same range. You can take a look at the corner over here. That's a good indication. Right around here, it starts to smooth out. So those are the areas that we want to focus on. And before we get our calculation, let's compare the two, the before and after. So the top one is without input shaping. This is Y. Bottom one, width. You can definitely see how it improved that line. Same over here. Without, width. And we'll take a look at X. Without, you can see how consistent that resonance is all the way up. And again, around in this area, it's almost non-existent. I like to actually look at the letters on the back. It's pretty obvious where the best frequencies are. This is without, again, you can see here in the arms, right in the middle of that X, there's nothing. Same way with Y. You can see how pronounced without all these echoes are in the part. They're much less down here after input shaping has been enabled. So now that we have our calibration test, we need to figure out what frequency is best for our 3D printer. And because of how this part was created, it's using microscopic amounts of increase in that frequency all throughout the part. And we know it's printed at a 0.2 layer height. So we have a really good idea of where these changes are being made. And I'm going to show you a trick by looking at the G-code here in a moment. But I just like to hone it in with my ruler. You can get really crazy with this with your caliper. But I like just to make a rough guess here. You can see around the 30 millimeter mark where things have really improved. So if I was doing this on my printer, I just start at about 30 millimeters. So let's call that good for X. And here's why. I'm going to say around 35 is the best for Y. A little bit more than X. And make sure you're running these parts at the speed you would normally print at. Take a look at all the aspects. Remember I said about the distance on these spaces? Just pick the one that looks the best, and you're going to be pretty close to dialing in Input Shaper. So back to the Marlin page. We now know that 30 millimeters and 35 millimeters on that part look pretty good as far as input shaping goes. But now you have some math to work out based on that layer number. And it does give you the formula here, and there's also a calculator. But since we already generated that G code, it's just as easy to go to the G code, do a quick search, and get the number. It's already there for us. So back to your slicer, if you exported your G-code, you can just pull that up in your text editor. I use Notepad++. But you can see it tells you each layer, the layer change. So basically all you have to search for is Z colon and then the layer you want. Now I said again 30 and 35 millimeter. So if we just do a control F, close this to make it bigger, We'll do semicolon, Z, colon, and we'll just punch in 30. That should give us our height. We jump down to the G code, and there's the 30 millimeter layer change. To prove that, if you just hit find again, you'll jump to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and so on. Because it's a 0.2 layer height. 
And then really close to where that change is going to be is going to be that M93 command that it used in the calibration with your frequency number. Now you don't have to get this granular with this 0.2727. You're not going to know that big a difference. But 37 is going to be your number for X. So then we'll grab the number for Y. We decided 35 millimeter to look pretty good. We'll find that. Here's our M593 command. It's setting it around a 41. So your Y number is 41. Now again, since input shaping is enabled, you could just set these in EEPROM. I'll show you that here in a second. But you can also hard code them in your config. So shaping frequency for X, 37. For Y, 41. And these are just the settings to get you started. There's a few other things here, and there is also input shaping type that has not been implemented yet. So in the coming versions of Marlin, we might go do a deeper dive with how all of this works because we'll have more shaping algorithms available. But for now, this is going to get you going. One other setting that you might want to look at is the shaping menu. If you take the comment off of this line, you're going to have the options on your LCD screen to set these frequencies. So if you're going to flash your printer firmware anyway, you might want to go ahead and enable this if you have some extra memory. And if you don't want to flash again right now, we can just open up the terminal and set it in EEPROM. Just use something like Printerface. You can do the M503 to see the whole configuration on your printer. You can just do an M593 to see input shaping. You can see that calibration left it at 60. We haven't rebooted the printer. But we can just make those updates right here. So we'll just do M593 X F 37 and then M 593 Y F 41 M 593 to look at it again. Our updates have been made M 500 save it to EEPROM and every print you do after this will have your input shaping settings enabled. And just to show you how you make updates from the LCD, if you hit the button, Go down to Configuration, Advanced Settings, scroll down, you have Input Shaping. And you can set your settings right in here. You can see after we flashed, they've already been updated. So if you're familiar with Marlin firmware, this is a really easy feature to implement. And remember, I'm just roughing this in to show you the difference for this video. If you're doing this, take your time, maybe run a couple of different prints to make sure that you have the calibration dialed in that's going to give you the best bang for the buck. Also, there are some features in Marlin that haven't been implemented yet that are going to make this just a little bit better, so we'll see those in the future. And remember, you can't use that accelerometer. But I've heard some rumblings here and there. Maybe there's some fixes that we can do. Maybe some other devices we can use to get that done with Marlin. So we'll see what comes down the road. But already, it's an impressive add-on. And now, let's do some testing and see what benefits we're going to gain. And just for fun, now that we have Input Shaper set up, all of our settings are in the firmware and on the printer. I'm going to go to Printer Settings. I'm going to take out our M593 command. And I'm going to re-slice. And we can run our test part again from bottom to top with our new Input Shaper settings. So here's that test complete without the calibration settings just with the input shaper values we've entered in the firmware. And you can see right here where we were looking at those artifacts before, they are almost non-existent. If we turn the part, it is a little tricky to see in the camera. Very faintly, you can see some artifacts. Those are more vertical artifacts, not the ringing that we were seeing before, not the echoing that you see. So it's pretty much removed them. This is X, we'll go to Y. Same thing in here, pretty much gone. Now this part was printed at the same speed as the calibration. Increasing speed would definitely increase ringing, but right now I'm pretty impressed with just the rough settings that we have. And just a quick comparison, before here on the top, you can see that echo, and then after. I like to take a look at the edge of the prints, again before and after. This is X, we'll move to Y. 
I think you can see it even more drastically here. The before print and after. And take a look at that edge. Much cleaner after input shaper. And of course we have to look at a couple of benchies. You weren't going to get out of this video without it. This is before input shaper. I tuned this one at regular speed. Remember, we are using log here. This one takes about an hour and a half to complete. You can see the ringing here. On the benchy, this is where it's usually most noticeable. And then after input shaper, I sliced one. We got it down to right at an hour. If you see in that same area, there's no ringing at all. So it's made a definite improvement. If you want to take a look at those side by side, not only did we shave off time from no input shaper to input shaper, we improved the quality. So there we go, input shaper implemented in Marlin firmware. And it is available in multiple types of firmware, Clipper and RepRap. But again, Marlin is what we use around here a lot. It's really easy to implement and it's great to see that it's available and it's going to be available for a lot of different 3D printer manufacturers that are still utilizing this firmware as pretty much the basis for their company. Now, I always say this with Input Shaper, use it responsibly. If you smooth too much, if you use this resonance compensation, you could create inaccuracies in your part. It's not all about making the best looking part, it's about making some functional, dimensionally accurate parts as well. So just be careful. It's a great feature, but you can overutilize it if you're trying to achieve these breakneck speeds. So hopefully you found this helpful. That is it for today, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.